Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, my first machining video was a video on inverted threading, and that was on June 6th of 2016. And I shot that video because, like most of us, you got a little bit of downtime. You watch YouTube for God knows what. But I continued to see videos about guys threading towards the headstock, and it just pissed me off, for lack of a better term. And I went out to my lathe with a GoPro handheld camera. It's all kinds of shaky. If you haven't watched it, take a look at it. And I shot that video. I was pretty passionate about that subject, and that motivated me to get out there and do that. And today is no exception. Uh, I've been at this, walked into my first machine shop in 1970. Now, you can go ahead and do the math on that. But I've been doing this full time since 1976 and six years prior to that in school. And not until about two years ago did I hear the term cosine error. Now all of a sudden cosine error seems to be a big thing, but I really haven't seen anybody adequately describe what a cosine error is in a mechanical standpoint. Now there's been a lot of people that have made outstanding videos on this topic, and John Saunders over there at uh, NYC CNC posted one, I believe it was earlier this year, and did a fantastic job. Uses a bunch of indicators, blocks, speaks real clear and, and very uh, articulate in his presentation. So if you haven't seen that one, go see it. John Saunders, NYC CNC. Go check it out. It's pretty good. Well, a lot of people, you know, we all learn differently. And I learn by, by looking at something. If I can visualize it, I can get it. You know, you can talk until you're blue in the face. Until I can see it mechanically in my mind, it's just words. So I'm going to hopefully describe or show you what a cosine error is, and I'm just going to challenge some of you to say uh, the cosine error doesn't always exist. So if you watch this video, if you watch what I'm going to do here, and I will take you into the surface plate, and I will prove to you that what I'm saying here is accurate, by all means, challenge me on the comment lines. It's one of the things I like about YouTube. So let's do this. All right. A cosine error basically is a false reading from an indicator because of the way you have the indicator set up. I'm going to talk about a drop indicator. A one inch travel drop indicator. Let's do that first because that's easy. You have the face on the indicator, you have the body, and you have the part coming out. Let's put a ball on there just for yucks. When this is zero, your dial's on zero. That is the way this is, this is designed to function. It's also intended to function with the body of this indicator at a right angle to the part both ways, this way and this way. That is the ideal scenario. That translates to when this ball moves up to here, half an inch or 600 or whatever, it's going to come back to zero here. Pretty simple, right? It's just logic. If everything is nice and straight, well, when this moves, this is going to give you the reading that it's designed to give you. Let's look at it from the side. You have the body of your indicator. Let's say your bezel's here, so you can see it. Here's your spindle. Here's your arm. Now if you put that exact same block underneath this indicator and you move this indicator back to here, this indicator had to travel all this distance to achieve this height. So which one's greater? This one's greater. This is the height that you're checking. This is the stroke of the indicator. It's longer. You're going to see a different reading on this and what you're checking. There's the mechanics behind a cosine error. Simple. Now let's talk about a lever style indicator. That's completely different and that's the one that's got me all fired up. I hope you're paying attention. This indicator is laying down and I've sliced it in half so we can see what's going on on the inside. Now I know that on a staric last word indicator, 
there is a helix on the axis of the indicator needle and as you move the tip of the indicator little rubies ride up and down in that helix and turn that helix so the needle moves so let's assume that's what we're looking at whatever you have a gear a rack a helix whatever my argument has been and always will be that the reading on your dial is a function of the rotation at this point right here a lot of guys say okay well the body of the indicator and the needle and everything has got to be in line within 10 degrees that means on most indicators as the tip is positioned it is this 10 degrees that they're referring to right there 10 degrees either way it's going to give you a great reading on the dial it's going to be very accurate to what you expect to see as your error I say wrong it doesn't have to be 10 degrees it's the contact of that needle to the part that you're checking that needs to be relatively constant within 10 degrees and I say it's perpendicular to the center line of the tip there we go forgive me if I'm shouting but I'm all fired up about this so we're just gonna keep on going bust the place up while I'm at it I say it's the tip relationship to the contact surface within 10 degrees not the relationship of this to the arm Does that make any sense it makes perfect sense because if you think about it the true rotation of this needle of this arm right here of the tip will give you a true translation of the movement regardless of where that body is now if you take the body and you move it down here so long as that tip remains within a constant to the part that you're checking the angle of the tip does not matter in relationship to the angle of the body of that lever style indicator and I will walk you over there right now and I'm going to prove this and with any kind of luck what I just showed you on this is going to translate to that granite and you're going to walk away going huh it's not as mystifying as everyone wants to make me think it is so let's take a walk and I'll prove it let's start off with the drop indicator the same way we started off on the board you can see the body of this indicator is very true to the one two three block that it's sitting on Lower it down and zero it out. Suppose that would help with it. Okay. Repeatable, straight, true, 600 block, which means this needle should come back around to zero. Which it does. And it'll come back to zero. As long as whatever gauge block you stick under there is naturally uh, incremental 100 thou. But this is nice and straight, so you're going to get a true reading. That's the whole idea. Let's kick it. Considerable angle. Zero it. exact same block 600 this is the cosine error demonstrated on the board let's count them one two three four five six let's go to 650 before you stick the block under there there you go 637 and that's because the drop indicator is now moving along the hypotenuse of the triangle and not the height of the triangle back to zero 600 block 637 and a half on the reading so 
Okay, point made. Let's talk about the lever style indicator. This is the one that has probably the most visibility and will probably cause the most arguments. What most people believe and what most people suggest is to keep the tip of your indicator relatively true to the body of your part. Now if you paid attention during the video, you know that my argument is that this needle needs to be perpendicular to your part and it doesn't matter what the tip is to the body. So let's see if that proves to be correct. This is the ideal scenario here. This particular orientation of this needle to this indicator body is the ideal scenario. It's nice and flat and true. The indicator is relatively true to the part. Everything's looking good. Can you see that? Let's see if we zoom in a little bit more. There you go. I'm gonna rock my little homemade base here until we get a zero. Actually, let's go to minus 10. There's minus 10 on the indicator. Hang on for just one second. I'm going to put a boom on this camera. We can look straight down on it. In this orientation, the needle is in line with the body of the indicator. The indicator is relatively level. I'd say within 10 or 15 degrees. And I'm going to use a ten thou shim, and I know this shim is a couple of tenths over, so I can expect to see the needle jump to just above the zero. Which it does. Now more so than having an accurate ten thou reading on all these angles I'm going to show you, I'm looking for repeatable results to prove that the angle of the tip to the body of the indicator doesn't matter. In this configuration you can see that the indicator tip itself is about 50 degrees to the body of the indicator. Now a lot of people are going to say, oh that's never going to work. Well, I bet it does. I am going to zero this so that it looks to be 10 through the camera. You'll have to forgive me, my fingers are a little sore right now, and this knob is just a little on the... There we go. Now if all goes well, this needle's coming around to the zero, or slightly above as it did before. There you go. I would say that's almost exactly the same reading we had when that needle was flat to the body of the indicator, and the indicator was parallel to the work surface. Let's bend that one more time, take another angle, take a look. Alright, in this configuration we have gone extreme the other way. We are almost 80 degrees uh, perpendicular to the center line of the indicator. And once again I have the tip of the indicator positioned within my comfort 10 degree zone to the workpiece. Let's spin this around and get a look at the zero. Let me put that on zero so the camera can see it. And if these results are consistent, we're going to see a zero to plus a couple of tenths with this feeler gauge. Identical. Guys, I'm telling you, the relationship of the body of the indicator to the, to the tip doesn't mean anything. It's the tip to the workpiece that matters. I just showed you three different configurations with the same reading. Take it to the bank. That's all I got. Alright guys, well I hope that the practical demonstration on the surface plate uh, supported what I told you in the opening statements on this video and that you can see exactly what I was trying to talk about. 
In closing, there is one other demonstration, one other graphic I would like you to take a look at so that it's, it's just stupid clear. If you have a surface, and imagine a pendulum, steel rod with a ball on the end and a pivot point, simple. If you have that ball laying flat, and you stick a shim underneath of this, it is going to move that distance. Makes sense, right? If you take that same thing and stand it up, I'm going to draw this a little bit bigger, and you try to sneak that shim underneath it, well, when you put that 10 thou shim under here, you might get five degrees worth of rotation back here before it clears. When you put that shim under here, it's going to have to go way out here before it clears, and the angle is going to be greater than this angle here. So it's all about that pendulum effect. The more direct you are to the contact, the more error you're going to see. And it's not necessarily an error. When an indicator gives you a greater reading than you expect, it's telling you how much the indicator moved. It may not be telling you the error in your part, but it is telling you how much that indicator moved. So take a good hard look at your setup and uh, take it from there. Anyway, thank you for letting me get that off my chest. I feel better now. Until next time, Joe Pizinski, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.